Hello and welcome to this episode of Imagineering, where we try and help you move up in the world and not just on with it. My wonderful guest today is Brian Vincent Moore. He is the Managing Director of Celebrating Humanity International. He specializes in story writing, public speaking, diversity shows, diversity training, transformational team building and team conflict resolution through exhilarating learning methodologies. Brian, along with Arthi Moore and their teams, have shared knowledge, grown people, and built professional teams in South Africa, Hong Kong, Namibia, Swaziland, Zambia, USA, and the UK, which is probably why he speaks like a bazillion languages. So with that lengthy introduction, Brian, thank you for doing this episode, and welcome to Imagineering. Brilliant. Thanks, Brand. Um, <clears throat> that was a brilliant intro. I just need to let you know that we have now separated into two different businesses. Oh, okay. RT is running Celebrating Humanity International, and I've started diversity training in South Africa and transformational team building in uh, PTY Limited. Uh, focus being that I want to expand into the rest of Africa. Mm. I want to expand into the world, and um, Arthi is brilliant. She's phenomenal, she's fantastic. Uh, we were once married, and we've got two great children together, but uh, our paths have switched a little bit in terms of how we operate and how we run the business. So mm -hmm. I'm excited, and she's excited, and um, yeah, uh, we're doing the same things. The rest of what you said there was perfect. I mean, absolutely brilliant. Um, we both do the same thing, which means we're duplicating. Oh, well, you know, the more people that spread diversity and, and understanding, you know, the better, so... Uh, more power to you guys, I think. Oh, absolutely. And I know that, that, that Arthi, uh, as I, has her heart in the transformation of our Africa. You know, I like when you said our Africa, because I was speaking to someone else a few months ago, and he said, it's like, yes, we do have the, the, the Sadiq region now, but there's no, like, we're not on the same level of cooperation as, like, the European Union is, you know, with a... Uh, with a free trade agreements and all kinds of things between each other. Is that something that you think is a viable thing for, for Africa? It will become viable when our politicians take on a consciousness of integrity, um, corruption free uh, borders, corruption free crossings, when we take the same outlook on this unity, the African unity, as they have done in Europe, at that point, when we put in place the same systems, where a Zambian walks through Oatambo Airport through the I belong here entrance, where in Europe, where you go, there it goes, Europeans, non-Europeans. Now, everybody calls me a European here. <laughs> <laughs> in when I go to England, I mean, I go to Europe, I'm a non-European. So when we can get that right and we just have the African, and even though I am pink, I walk through the African entrance because I was born in Africa. And when we get to the point where we can trust each other, when we get to that point, we will set our economies free. We will grow, unemploy grow employment. We will build these nations through their own resources. We have to do it. I like when you said I was born African. Now on one of your Facebook posts that I've been stalking you now for a while so that I can you know, <laughs> prepare myself for this interview. And you said that you won the, uh, you won third place in a humorous speech contest with the title, I'm not born white. Well, I wasn't born white. Yes. So how did that go? Yes. Uh, it, it was brilliant, you know, um, when I came to South Africa from Zambia, I was uh, a young boy who only spoke English. I was a bit of a loner, so I didn't really relate to my much older brother and my much younger brother. So I ended up on the farms. Um, as they say in Sizulu, they say, I herded cattle. I, heard the I cut sugar cane. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and I was, I, was, I was like on the farm roads going everywhere. And the, the, this nation was a nation of love. It didn't matter what color you were, as long as you were respecting the people. And so my Zulu 
grew exponentially. By the squirrel, they were putting Afrikaans into a stick via my behind. <laughs> okay, but, at, <laughs> but at home, uh, on the trading store, on the weekends, etc., because I was in boarding school, there was love. There was love. There was care. If I wanted to get out the house, I'd jump in the bread delivery van and I'd travel from little store to little store to homes to wherever this man delivered. He was like my buddy. He was my guide. And back at home, the guy who lived on the property was the local chief. And he had one of his wives on our property. And uh, through my interactions with him and learning Isi Zulu, I learned some words that maybe I shouldn't have learned. Uh, boys always ask, what is the word for that part of their body? You know? uh, okay. uh, that special little component that's always within reach. <laughs> <laughs> So I learned this word, Amasende. So when the Nkosi, the chief, was slaughtering a goat for his new son, I said, I want the nuts. I want the nuts. And as soon as Bob, they were delivered to my house. <laughs> and I had these two big things that I had to consume, or I would have embarrassed myself and the Nkosi. So, you know, my, my life started there. I was very Zulu. I was very African. and very delighted with all of these things because I knew no different. Back at school, I was speaking Zulu more than any other white kid, even if they came from a farm. So one day I was walking down the road, around about 18, 19 years old, and I greeted some ladies on the side of the road. This is in the middle of the bush between the sugarcane fields. And they greeted me back with, they had a look of surprise on their face. They're going, how can't it? Where did this white person learn Zulu? And I came up with a story. I was shocked that they could possibly even think that I was white. <laughs> <laughs> how dare you, sir? <laughs> exactly. I said, how? I'm saying, well, no, I'm not there. I said, you know what happened? I was, hey, Jang Rawe, I was black like you. And I was walking the streets of Durban in a bad area. And these guys came out and they beat me. You know, a black chicken. <laughs> His feathers are all black, but underneath <laughs> the pants, you saw a pack, perfectly white. And they beat the feathers out of me and I had pink spots and everything everywhere. And then, washi aganje, they left me just like that, white. White, plucked up all of my feathers. <laughs> and so, <laughs> I have a wonderful life. <laughs> that's a, that's such a cool speech. I wish I heard that. Wow, that's so amazing. Oh, I love the you know taking control of your own sort of a uh, of your own story, and I think that's so so, so important. You know. Because it's redefining who you are or in or how people perceive you, you know, it's like, I think jokes, yeah. especially, you know, it's so, it's so wonderful to, and I think diversity relies on not taking ourselves too seriously, perhaps. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. Um, uh, one of our trainees on one of our Celebrating Humanity courses said, be sensitive, but don't be sensitive. And I looked at him going, eh, what did you say? And he says, be sensitive of other people's feelings, but don't be sensitive about yours. I mean, for heaven's sake, you know who you are. Yeah. So there's freedom in that. Um, there's even more freedom in being able to um, have, like last night, uh, I heard a guy's accent. I heard he was Afrikaans. Uh, to, to and a lure for me, he looks at me and he goes, is he Afrikaans? He's like delighted. He found his brother in the midst of all of this difference. And I said, me ain't like me, not really, you know, but I love Afrikaans people because they bring so much wonder and humanness and, and humility and care. It's all a part of their nature. Uh, and then I switched to the guys next to me who were from Ghana. And I greeted them in Twi. And they were shocked and excited and 
and Sigma delighted Phillip that I ran have. out. <laughs> <laughs> that is the nature of diversity: is everything lies in a greeting. So if you I can like greet that. a person in their language, everything starts with a greeting. You get married because you greeted the girl that you ended up marrying. Mm. Um, Obama greeted Raul Castro at Nelson Mandela's memorial ceremony. Cuba and America became friends. Now, wow. Donald Trump, he's not doing much good about that because yeah, he's trying to track them out. But soon after that meeting, uh, at Man Mandela's uh, uh, memorial, Obama was in Cuba. And their relationship will start with a greeting. Started with a greeting. Something so sensitive. Get out there and learn how to be respectful to more people. There's a quote by Mandela. I think it's by Mandela. I'm not sure. But, you know, speak to a person, greet a person uh, in a tongue that they learned and you speak to their mind, but speak to the tongue that, that they, something like that. I, I can't remember the quote now. I'll probably yeah. look it up. But it's like you speak to their hearts or something like that. Yeah, if you, if, you, if you greet a person in their own language, you speak to their heart. If yeah. you greet a person in a language that they've had to learn, you speak to their head because it's an intellectual conversation as opposed to how you know me. Yeah. You so know me. So um, interestingly, I worked in, uh, got to work in Namibia with the De Beers Mining Group. Ah, okay. And on the way to this interview, I stopped off in Cape Town and I had very little time to get prepared. Uh, and 20 minutes in, uh, Oranjemund to do my thing and explain what we are and who we are. So in Cape Town Airport, I met this guy who looked different. He didn't look South African. Uh, and I said to him, hi, where are you from? He says, Namibia. This is like that deep Namibia voice here. Yeah? And I said, what language do you speak there? And he goes, Oshiwambo. And then he, then he taught me something. He said, you South Africans call it Ovambo, but we do not have a V in a W. It's Oshiwambo, you see. So I said, cool, how do you greet? He says, Walale Po. And I mean, I take out my pen and I start to write this down. And I go, cool, Walale Po. I have not yet linked it to Lala in Zulu, which means to sleep. How did you sleep? Ah. So I then say, ah, cool. So, Walale Po, is that all day? And he goes, no. And he goes, Wuhale uh, Po is in the afternoon. Mwatokelwa Po is in the evening. And I'm writing like a mad thing. So, uh, and then I said, how do you say thank you? And he nearly blew me away because I've never heard anything like it. He goes, on da pandurunen. <gasps> now, this is totally different than anything that's in my brain. This radio station is not picking up that signal. <laughs> <laughs> When I arrive at the airport, I get off the plane, I walk up to the first person, I go, Wala Po, and he says, that's not my language. I said, oh my God, out comes the paper. I said, what is your language? He said, Oshi Herero. I said, how do you greet? He goes, Ore. So I said, cool, is that um, all day? He goes, yes. I go, oh, I'm saved. I don't have to do the morning, afternoon, and evening. I then walk to the next person, and I say, Wala Po, Kore, and she goes, those are not my languages. So Nubia has got diversity. Okay. So uh, I said, what, what, what is your greeting? She goes, Kain class. Yeah. So I said, that, that's quite intense. You know? And she goes, she says, well, you can say Matisa. So I arrive in this meeting with six or seven languages in greetings. I open my presentation with these greetings. People are in the room going, that's my language. Ha, huh? did you hear that? He's from South Africa. He knows me. Guess who got the work? Fantastic. And you did that on your way there because you made an effort. On my way there. It doesn't have to and take a lot. Thousand people. Hmm? So it doesn't have to take Sorry, a lot. It just needs to take a first step, an effort. The first step is acknowledging that you are a human and you come from a special place in terms of your languages, greetings, cultures. I even have Namibian proverbs that I use in my training. The one is, uh, I'm trying to get people to talk up because there is a reticence amongst the more shy people, uh, but amongst the hard people, the sensitive people to ah. speak up in public. So I looked for a saying that was similar to 
the Zulu one, Ingani Engakali Felembele Kwen, a child that does not cry will die in its mother's back. Could get smothered. Okay, so the uh, Oshiwamba version is Antu Oeshi, Japo Pikaeshi, Jamwen. I learned that and used it throughout my whole training because it related to the people and they knew what I was talking about. They're going, hey, let me speak, let me speak. They left their shyness behind. The shyness behind, yeah. I like that saying, the, a child that does not cry will be, uh, will die on his mother's, mother's, mother's back. back. And I think, you know, it's sort of like, um, I think it was in London when on the trains and there's like these posters, like, if you see something, say something, sort of thing, you know, like that sort of thing. And I think if something is bothering you, you need to speak up, you know, otherwise, if it just sort of, if you try and compartmentalize it, it will come out and it won't come out in a way that you want it to. Very much so. And I think uh, you know, to go on the other side of that is every person in this world that you meet up with is your guru or your teacher. So you, through just what we've done now, have brought new thinking into me. You have had experiences. You have had things that you have learned, that you have seen, that you have felt. If I spend my time living in the question, i.e., I don't talk about me, I ask you questions about you. Yeah. How much am I going to learn? So That's this weekend, we learned how to greet in Romanian. For heaven's sake, there's a Romanian tour bus coming through. So I've picked up some Romanian. I still go and swat it a little bit. But if I meet a Romanian, I know that they are in an Italian kind of language. And I'm able to greet them and welcome them and all of those kind of things. And these guys looked so lost until we did that. I love that. I love the idea of living in the question. That's like a, we should make that like a Brian V. Moore quote. You know, it's like live your life in the question. <laughs> You know, it, it, I think that's brilliant. And that's really what the point of these imaginary talks are. It's to, well, to help me stimulate my own creative thinking and to get more ideas, but also anybody else that watches this, uh, whether you're watching this on YouTube or listening to it on SoundCloud or Podbean or whatever it may be, uh, what ideas are you getting, you know? And if you're watching this on YouTube or listening to this anywhere else, uh, drop me a comment and what culture are you? What language are you? You know, do you have any proverbs that you want to share of your language or your culture? I would like to see some of those. I love that you said, you know, we were talking now before we started recording about not identifying yourself as one race or another race, but as a human being. And there's only one race of a human being. There's only one kind of human being and that's a human being. I, I love that yeah. idea, you know, my mentor, Alan Black, also told me once that front, if we focus on how different we are, it will do nothing more than divide us. But if we celebrate our diversity, how much can we learn from each other? That will that diversity will develop us. And I've taken I've taken that to heart because I find it so too in creativity, in speaking, in anything that I do. I only see things from my perspective, but now I've got the benefit of Brian's perspective, you know, and and that adds so much value to my life. Absolutely, Brant. Um, I was married to Arthi. Arthi is a Hindi name. Arthi is a Hindu. My children are a beautiful, gorgeous, stunning combination of the two of us. They're two of the most handsome and intelligent young men, 13 to 18. Um, they're really exciting. But now the South African schools, they have a rule. You have to write down what color or race a person is and identify them that way. So every year I'd get this little document saying street address, phone number, blah, blah, schnog, all of the normal details. And then it would go down and go father, white, mother, Indian, children, colored. Sorry, I was putting that accent on there just for fun. Okay. Uh, the, the fact is my children are not children, they're uh, colored, they're my children. My wife was my wife and the most beautiful wife I could possibly have ever had. But she was my wife, and in my head and my heart, she was just my wife. And I never ever looked and said, Oh, good morning, Indian woman. It is good to see you for breakfast. I want the Indians on that side of the table, please. The Kalats, please sit across. I want to guide you both. Um, and my, me, the big white man, is going to sit in the end. Come on. 
come on, these are my children and my wife. What is wrong? So I never signed that. Yeah. I wrote human all over it. I scratched human. I put it with a pokey pen. I colored it in. And I sent it back to him. I said, never ever send me this again. Next mm. year, like clockwork. In the post. White, Indian, colored. They couldn't get it. They couldn't get it. So my children are classified good for BEE, Black Economic Empowerment. My wife is perfect for Black Economic Empowerment. Mina, I'm the white person in the sandwich. It is just so silly. We are a South African, African uh, family with such wonderful diversity. For us to be separated as humans is very sad. That is sad. And it's damaging because I think that stops us from thinking better and thinking more and, and learning from each other and our different experiences. Absolutely. Absolutely. There's, there's no freedom in being separated. And if, if, if people can take the example of our family and how well and brilliant we are together, my 13-year-old was learning 13 languages at the same time because we meet people of these different languages. He was 12 at the time. He's writing two books. My 18-year-old is an internet in entrepreneur. He greets in 50, 60 languages. He got stopped at the airport. Yeah, yeah, 50, 60. He got stopped at the airport. And the cops came around and they said, hey, Mr. Moore, he's 17. So like getting a mister is not bad, yeah? So they say, we need you to come with us. We found a gun in your luggage. The poor kid starts and he sees all of these people around him. And he just starts reeling out these greetings. They started to laugh. They take him off to a room where he has to open his bag and his brother has left a toy gun an airsoft gun in his bag, which is so realistic. So as he's taking the bag out, he said they all had their hands on their guns. I thought I was going to die. He says there are now about 18 of them. So I started greeting again. And he says they laughed and they laughed and they laughed. They said, because you showed us respect, you better run. Your plane's about to leave. <laughs> so they got him on the same plane to meet me in Cape Town to run diversity training. I love that story. It just shows the humanness of it all, isn't it? Yeah, absolutely. And all of those languages, he knows 50 to 60. I mean, um, uh, he's now working with his mum. So part of what we do is we greet the people in the room to let them know that we know them. To let them know and that so we know them. Way beyond anything, yeah. I like that. So now to a bit more of a unfortunate subject is the the xenophobic attacks, what's been called the xenophobic attacks in, in Johannesburg and Pretoria, I think. Uh, how, how does one deal with that sort of thing on a, in a diversity, if you're doing our diversity training and diversity development and, and, and trying to tell people that we're all humans at the end of the day, how do you speak on something like that? The most important thing is to speak to the value of the unity. Now, our country has a major problem with unemployment. And our people have got used to working for people. A lot of people have left our country because of the un unfortunate politicking that goes on that is based in color, that is based in race. And I don't want to mention any politicians' names, mm. but there are a multitude of them that are separating us by these different cultures and races and colors and things. That is a big problem. Now, what's happened is we, we've gone through a stage of a massive loss of money in the country through corruption. Again, no names, no pactrol. We don't have the money to run the country, so therefore we don't have the money to grow the businesses to create the economy that employs our people. But people from... Zimbabwe, Mozambique, uh, Malawi, Nigeria, Namibia, um, all over Africa have arrived in our country. Even people from some of the Eastern countries have arrived in our country and within weeks, months, have set up opportunities, businesses. They negotiate how much they earn. So they, these guys may go seven days a week 
on a smaller amount of money and they're making the same kind of money, but they're working hard. And then some of them are joining together and creating almost like cooperatives to form little businesses. And other guys are now trying to work on their own in the individual way, which is not the African way. African way is to work together. So if they took on Ubuntu and worked together, they too could have been in competition. In fact, they could have made friends with all of these guys. And in making friends, they create an environment where they work together in a system that is working against them at the moment. So once we look at people as possibly friends and definitely um, people of knowledge, skills, influence, join them. So people are actually, I don't believe that there's as much xenophobia as xenophobia is an excuse for them to go and rob shops to get food because they don't have food. Really? They don't have money. So I don't think there's an opportunity. Criminality. A justification. Criminality. And some people will then, ah, it's them. They took our jobs. No, you never applied for them. You never went out looking for them. You never went out and said, hey, let me get a few friends together. Let's start a car wash. Something, anything. We can create our own businesses. I have not been employed directly for 30 years. My brothers-in-law happen to be Hindu, have never been formally employed, yet they are spray painters, mechanics. They can fix anything. They can make anything. They are great allies to have on your side. Or you can go and hit them on the head with a stick and call them names. There's no benefit in the second option. Let us join together as human beings and make Africa work. Let's make Africa work. I, you know, I think because I also tell people that creativity lives in a cooperative age. It's not a. It's not. Look, competition is good, right? Competition can help. Uh, people excel in all kinds of things, but like you say, you know, that's not the African way to solely compete is not a good strategy for long-term successful uh, planning or results. You have to work together. You have to have not just a competitive edge, but a cooperative one. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And, and I like working together with people that want to work. Uh, but I am not in a place of charity directly, except when somebody comes to my door and says they're hungry. The African way says you feed them. Um, there's a Zulu saying, How big is the stomach of a traveler? It's only as big as the kidney of a small bird. Therefore, you must give them enough to get to the next place. Wow. That's amazing. Yeah, there's so many proverbs in Africa that can help us. In, yeah, in terms of diversity in Zambia, they say, um, a man who believes his mother's cooking is the best has never left home. Get out and experience the diversity. You're going to find some good chow out there and good people. Uh, another one from Tswana, from Botswana is... Um, uh, um, the highest form of war is dialogue. Ooh, I like that. The highest form of war is dialogue. Yeah. The highest form of war is dialogue. So, so now there's all of these people that are now making money. We're not making money. We don't have to hit them. We have to hear them. We have to ask the questions, live in the questions, find the answers, find the solutions. And in Africa, together. all answers are here. Because yeah. that is the African way. That is the African way. And well, I was told on, on uh, Facebook the other day that I'm not entitled to train diversity training because I'm white. And it was this guy from Cape Town that's living in total anger against anybody that happens to be pale. And he wants to do the diversity training because he is going to tell them where they fit. <laughs> Shouldn't be involved. That's so sad. He's already judging. He's already judging. <laughs> and there's so much to do. But you know, I, yeah. um, I had a conversation with a former colleague of mine. <laughs> and he says, you know, the wonderful thing about our school is that 
it's so diverse. And that's why we're winning all these competitions. That's why we're doing so well in all these different areas. And I said, but that's the, that's the wonderful thing about diversity is it's not just a one mindset, right? You get the experience from a whole bunch of different cultures and what to do, how to do it, and how to, to come together. And that's why you're succeeding. It's not because you're only letting in Afrikaner boys or only upper yeah. class English, English lads, you know, or, or uh, it's only a school for women. It's only a school for these type of people, you know. It's everybody's welcome, you know. We work together better when we understand that it's not just you, it is not just me, it's us. Absolutely, absolutely. And until we get that right, um, we're going to struggle. Though we must also be careful of the opposite of that is when a culture has formed, like you have a German school or a madrasa, a, um, an Arabic Islamic school, you can't force them to take people that are outside their experience. Yeah. You have to ask them to find ways to experience. But that is their background, that is their culture, that is their religion. But um, what, what we find more and more and more is that people are recognizing this need. My children, <laughs> my children went to a school that's predominantly from a township nearby. And these little kids, whereas before they would be speaking with an African accent, the little Zulu kids are so English. Oh, hello, good morning, how are you? And I look at them, how, oh, how, oh, how, oh, how, oh, where ma? Can't you? It's low, it's such good English, you know? And they laugh, they say, I say, Akodoma, we speak. We speak Zulu. And um, to me, it's a delight because my children are growing up in this wonderful age where we can be who we are. We can and we be, can who, be, we be who they are. And who they are. Because uh, my little boy, one of his best topics is Afrikaans. And he's got this light sort of Indian, Italian look about him. But I stand out of it and I brought Afrikaans, you know. <laughs> uh, it's so awesome. It's so awesome. It's so awesome. I'm free. Uh, I'm free, Brent. I'm free. I can be anywhere, anyhow. And what bothers me, and not bothers me, because there is this change that is happening. And on Facebook, you'll see this lady who happens to be of my sort of complexion. And she puts a story with photographs of how these two African men stopped when she had a flat tire and she was outside the place of danger at Township. And they stopped and she's got them on Facebook and the one guy's name is Nsweli, the other is Hatteba. And she's praising them almost as if it would be unusual that a person of their background would be so good and kind to a woman because their nature is to help people. That's people, I think human beings, if you're raised proper, your intention and your need to help people is very strong. And yeah. I found that, especially with these Imagineering series, when I reach out to people who I've never even met in person, you know, I said, hey, I'm doing these series of talks on creativity, on innovation, and I just want to have a talk with you on, you know, what you do and, and have, a, have a talk, right? So I'm asking an hour of your time, right, for free, because I can't pay you. Uh, and I, I, and especially not what you're worth. And people say, I'd love to be involved. You know, it's like, I've never even met you, Brunt. You know, out of the blue, you're contacting me, but I'd love to be involved. And I'd love to, to give you an hour of my time. How amazing is yeah. that? Well, you, you see, Brunt, when we learn and we develop these skills, we have to be very careful that we don't put money before what we deliver to the world in terms of changing the world. So if I get a phone call tomorrow and I am penniless, which I did recently, I gave away a prize and I didn't have money for petrol. I had to ask the person for petrol money. I went to um, a halfway house and I ran some of my processes. Many of them were just about developing love and respect for self. And when I left there, we had a transformation that went beyond anything. You could not pay me enough for my delight to be covered by your cash. I don't know if you know what I mean by that. I have these skills. 
I'd rather spend 20 days giving away for free and working for so I can give it away for free in the other 20. Um, I want to make a difference. And being with you, who I know of, uh, of as a man of heart, humbleness, and integrity, is an absolute delight. And I do it 100 times a year for you. Well, thank you very, very much. Finally, I want to talk about forced diversity. Is that a good thing? Is that something that we should try and, and do? Is that something that's um, long-term successful? Okay, so firstly, are you talking about diversity training? No, I mean, like forcing people to be, uh, forcing, like the, um, what was it called? Uh, um, uh, affirmative action, I think. Um, when people are forced to be, when companies are forced to be more diverse. You know, if uh, we live in countries that have a good range of diversity, companies, businesses, organizations should be focusing on fairness as much, much as possible. So if you have a nation that's 80%, call it Zulu, 10% pale, uh, the balance from different Eastern countries or people from other countries, whatever, we should find a way to develop people to be able to operate. Or in fact, the chances are we don't need to develop them because there are so many people out there that fit anyway. Uh, I must be very careful with that one. But anybody who hasn't yet reached the level of that position in the company, we need to develop people so that every one of us get a share in nation in countries, in companies, in towns, villages, rural areas. We need to spread our shared diverse wisdom across the nation so that when they come in, we're going, hey, wow, I never knew that. And I thought because I grew up in this way, I knew everything. We don't, <laughs> we don't. And the more we involve people, the more our businesses grow because there are there's, there's, you look into this company and it's like the whole mirror of the country looks back at you. And you see in there, every one of you. So if you had a game reserve and it didn't have lions, elephants, tigers, crocodiles, because you felt that they didn't quite fit the profile, you don't have a game reserve. You don't have a country. You don't have a world. Forced. Why do we have to force? Because people are holding on too much to power. Let your power go and find your power. Your power is in the people of your nation. I love that. And I love what you said that this, we don't need to force diversity. There's already so many people that already fit the bill. You know, there's, yeah. and you know what, if we want someone that's more culturally diverse, um, do some diversity training, you know, and, and give them the skills, give people equal opportunity and, but it has to be equal, right? In all aspects. Yeah. Uh, so be fair. And I think that's one of the key messages here is, is fairness. And to look at yeah. things from more than one perspective. Humanness, yeah. 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 You, you see, Brent, the big thing is we don't do one-on-one -on -one diversity training. Mm. Because in order to do that, I need to judge you. So we do team diversity programs. Team Unity program. So conflict resolution, team conflict resolution is called Team Unity because that's where we're going. We're not going. You're not <laughs> back focusing the on the conflict. You're not focusing. You're yeah. focusing where you. You're focusing on where you want to lead it to. A absolutely. And so we celebrate people where they teaching each other, jumping up and shouting with each other. They are dancing. They are sharing problems. They are healing wounds, but they don't know they're doing that. Hmm. They don't know they're doing that. So, yeah, we love what we do because we can't give you a certificate as an individual who went to a PowerPoint lecture. But we can give you a picture of your team and saying, I was part of this. I was part of this team. Yeah. Yeah. I love that. Change the narrative and uh, focus on, on the humanity first. Be fair. I think these are good takeaways for us to end on this this imaginary talk. Brian, thank you so much. Uh, thank you for your time. Thank you for your efforts. And thank you for just being uh, uh, awesomeness. And, and uh, maybe 
maybe once upon a time all your feelings fell out, but uh, you grew and you are very colorful. So I think that's brilliant. So if you are watching this on YouTube or SoundCloud or anything, uh, Podbean, whatever it may be, um, leave a comment on what is your diversity like? What is your cultural influences? What are your takeaways from this talk? And just give me a, drop your comment on anything that you, that you found interesting, uh, anything that you want to counter or add to. And you can go to Brian's website and I'm absolutely certain you'll be happy to start a conversation with you. You can go to brianvmoore.com or uh, his other website is um, www.diversitytrainers.co.za diversitytrainers.co.za uh -huh. or even contact me on WhatsApp plus 27 72 677 0208 all right and those uh, all the links will be in the description and follow up and if you think your company needs to to be part of a team and focus on solutions rather than problems, contact Ryan or, you know, get in contact and, and start a conversation. I think that's the best way to, to put this and to end this. And if nothing else, be fair and enjoy your life. Ryan, thank you again and uh, hope to see you again. This has been Imaginary. Cool. On, da <laughs> on da Panduru Nene. Uh, danke schön. Danke schön. Just to give some of the German. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So, auf Wiedersehen. Uh, danke schön. Uh, and uh, see you again. This has been Engineering. signing off.